and uh, welcome. My name is Mark Mason. I'm the head of the Department of International Education and Lifelong Learning, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you Professor Kenneth King and his wife, Praveena King. Kenneth is an old friend of us, of ours, in Hong Kong. Um, although I first saw Kenneth, I don't think we met then, Ken, when you were at the University of Cape Town in about 93, 4, 5, I, I can't recall. I think as a guest of Peter Calloway, uh, a, a very eminent uh, historian of education at the University of Cape Town and an old colleague of mine there. Um, Ken was the, the director of the Center of African Studies and also professor of international and comparative education at the University of Edinburgh for more years than one might care to count, and, I, and, and I'm not going to be counting them now, um, and is now emeritus uh, at uh, the University of Edinburgh. But actually, I think he and Pravina spend less time in Edinburgh than they do in any other corner of, of the world. They are, they are inveterate travelers. Kenneth is always in Tanzania, looking at some educational development issue there, or in China, looking at uh, China's African development policies, or in India, looking at India's development issues, or whatever. Uh, he, he used to put on his email, if you want to contact me, I'm here right now. And I think it became too exhausting actually just to change his email signature every, every other day. So he sort of doesn't do that anymore. How he and Praveena keep it going, I'm, I'm not sure. If, uh, if we all have their amount of energy when we become emeritus, then I think very good for all of us. Um, Ken, as I like to tease him, is, is one of those people who I call a failed retiree. He'll, he'll never <laughs> retire. I was, I was, in your absence, I was saying to Praveen the other day, that as they're trying to nail yeah. down Ken's coffin, you, I've just got one more paper that I need to write, I've just got another thing I need to do. Because he really is indefatigable and has energy levels beyond what I can describe. His interests span quite a wide uh, range in, in that field of international development. If you really want to know what's going on in the history of the development, uh, for example, of this thing called SDGs, uh, which Ken is going to talk to us about now, he'll take you right back to 1990 and further back if you want him to, and he'll look for the discourse even before that. So if you need to know anything about education for all, or the Millennium Development Goals, or the Sustainable Development Goals, or what role Gordon Brown played in, 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 in the development of the SDGs, or Amina Muhammad, or anybody like that. Kenneth is, is the person whom you need to ask. Uh, a, a towering figure in the field, um, most recently the, the president of the British Association of International and Comparative Education, and a leading figure in the UK Forum for International Education and Training, which hosts every other year, in odd years, the uh, Akfid Conference, along with BASE uh, at uh, the University of Oxford. But I think that's a long enough introduction, Ken. Let, let, let me stop there and hand over to you um, on SDG 4. Thanks very much. Hello. Hello. Well, it, I didn't it's, uh, <laughs> Sorry. it's a very good time, I think, probably to be uh, to be talking about international cooperation in Hong Kong or in China more generally, because we've just had completed yesterday the uh, the two day event on international cooperation for the Belt and Road initiative in which they actually use the term international cooperation, the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. And those of you who are interested in that might have looked at the two-page communique today, two full pages, uh, not in SCMP, but in China Daily, um, which covers quite significantly the various international cooperation dimensions of this, including education. And uh, intriguingly, um, in view of our talking about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, it actually uh, refers here, these are some of the plans that China has laid out at the forum, agreed with 
to initiate the China and UN 2030 Agenda for a Sustainable um, Development Cooperation Initiative. Interesting, isn't it? Not the UN 2030 Agenda, but the China and UN Sustainable Development Agenda. There's a whole series of things here. That whole two columns is about the education cooperation dimensions of the One Belt, One Road. So it's quite an interesting timing to be talking about the construction of uh, global agendas and, and to be looking critically, which I think this, this department has very well served to do, to look at the somewhat slippery word international. The claim of international is certainly something that one needs to, to look um, analytically. If you like, the construction of the global is one thing that we're going to be talking about. So if we uh, look at some of the questions that we might raise today, the, these are some of them. Uh, how, how, how do these things get constructed? Is the world that's been constructed around the SDGs very different from what we saw, as Mark was saying, 20, 15 years ago in 1990? Or even earlier in the 40s. By the way, this PowerPoint is on the website. Emily has put it on there, so you can just download it. And if you drop me a line, I've written a paper around this, uh, which I can also send you if you send me and get my email at the end. Um, the whole process of um, joining up to international. That, you see, has been happening in the last two days. Those of you who are interested, who decided to come? Who, who joined up? At what level? My wife is from India. India is represented in Beijing only by somebody from the Indian Embassy in Beijing. So if you look at the Indian press, India is boycotting the forum, the international. So you see, the whole process of deciding whether Christine Lagarde would come, she did, Putin, but not those, this, but not that. It's a very interesting... Um, so the process of joining global processes is something that I think international students such as yourselves, looking at your different areas, whether they're from looking at Uganda or Pakistan or, uh, or other areas, the mainland, you, 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 are, you are concerned with the joining of these processes. And you're also concerned, as in I'll have a look at that today, at how you measure their engagement. And also, who's governing? What structures are governing the process? Once you've constructed an international agenda, international agenda, how, how, how does it get measured? And what we're going to look at a little bit is just one dimension of this process, which I think is quite a political process, deciding what is worth measuring, what are the indicators, once you've constructed the targets in the goal that we're going to be looking particularly at, Sustainable Development Goal 4 on education, once you've got the targets, how do you measure them? Um, so I just, I don't need to say to you here, that one of the things that's quite important is to look critically at text. And as somebody who did a history PhD, I think it's also quite important to know where do things come from. Things that are called global and international, where, where have they come from? Um, that's some of the prehistory of the SDGs. I think they, they're, they're, they're a kind of confluence of two different streams. One stream coming from um, back in the 1990s and 2000s with those two earlier attempts to construct an education agenda. Those are education, not world. The SDGs are across the whole um, development constituency. But these two education streams are constructing targets and goals in a way that we'll see whether it's different from what's happening now. The second stream, constructed in 
by the OECD, effectively, and reinforced by the Millennium uh, Development Process. Very simple compared to what we're going to be looking at now in the, in the, in the SDG 4. Very simple for policymakers to remember that the education MDG is universal primary education. Full stop. Simple indicator for it. And gender parity. That's it. That's the simplicity of the MDG process. And, but if you jump forward to look at the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal on Education, <coughs> there are a whole set of um, that's only one of the 17 goals and 169 targets. Can you imagine the review process if you've got to, as a national government, report to the, S to the UN Europe. But even if you look at the SDG 4, look how complicated the set of target adjectives are compared to what we had earlier in the, SD in the, in the MDG process. These are quite difficult terms to capture simply in an indicator. I mean, look at them all. That's all those are all in the first two or three targets. Um, now, UNESCO would claim that this chap, Naidu, from South Africa, as you probably know, uh, uh, Mark, um, claims that the process of constructing the SDGs is one of the most inclusive in the, the, in the UN's history. It's an interesting claim. I think it may be, it may be true that it has been incredibly uh, intensive in terms of numbers of meetings, involvement of NGOs, in a way that was simply not the case for constructing the MDGs. Very much a small process. This is a very, so the, the whole issue of ownership We'll come back to that, you see, if you look at what went on in Beijing in the last two days. It's very important to know who was there in order to get ownership, to claims of ownership if the US and Japan and India are not there, then the communique, you know how it works? The communique is not ours. So the ownership is quite important. Um, by contrast with the construction of the goals, 17 and the targets, the indicator process, now we may think, well, that's not very important, but the indicators are what countries are going to be using to report to the UN on an annual basis how they're doing. Now, we can talk later and we can raise questions. Do we need to do it? Does Britain have to do that? Does Hong Kong and mainland China, do they have to do that? Um, do they? But the process, compared to the inclusive process of constructing the goals and the targets, where you know, there are people who I know who have probably attended, or ask anybody, if anybody here has been done that, but some people that Praveen and I know have probably been at 30 different meetings to do with the, what was called the post-2015 process, before it was called the SDG process. For 14 or 15 meetings, but it's experts who are constructing the indicators. It's the international, the interagency expert group, IAEG. And they've constructed, for the 10 targets, they've constructed 11 indicators. I suspect people in the room have not looked at those. Is that a fair comment? You haven't looked at the indicators? Oh, there's one or two people who I think probably have. Um, and education being a complicated industry, UNESCO had a whole process that some of you will recall when, which went on in South Korea, the World Education Forum, and they also constructed a set of indicators for the SDG 4. That was before the final UN General Assembly, which set the um, set the targets and the goals, and I suppose in stone. And those thematic ones, there's no less than 32 of those. So you've got 
for education alone, you've got 43 indicators for judging whether a nation has reached a particular uh, one of the, uh, of the 10 targets. So the question that I'm going to just put in front of us, and we'll do it quite quickly, so that we have quick time to talk about other dimensions of the international, is what happens to these, these big adjectives that we referred to earlier, quality, rights to education, uh, quality and technical vocational education, if you look at the global indicators, i.e. what is being measured Measurement turns out to be a very important uh, dimension of uh, uh, achievement in these goals. And it's that, it's that measurement of the global indicators that's going to be sent to the UN. The national statistical offices are not going to be doing the whole 43. They're going to be looking at the ones that are of interest to in the UN, because that will then get constructed as the UN annual report on the SDGs. One section, education, some reference to Uganda, perhaps Kenya, perhaps Southern Africa, perhaps South Asia. So it'll be